and thank you for joining us today. My name is Chris Patrick. I'm the Director of Education and um, Certified Dementia um, Educator as well, as well as a Dementia Reality Master Trainer. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. And just as a reminder, this event is being recorded and we are currently on Facebook. Uh, let me just double check something. Okay, so we are, let me just get rid of this hiding. Okay, before we begin, I'd like to explain a little bit about ElderWorks. We are a uh, non-for-profit 501c3 organization whose mission is to provide older adults, seniors, and families information, referrals, and guidance for senior living, home care, and support services to help you make appropriate decisions. This includes education on senior topics for community members and topics for professionals. The guidance we provide will help seniors stay home well or transition successfully into new senior housing opportunities. If you have any questions through the presentation, I'd ask that you put them in the Q&A and I will answer them at the end of the program. Please note that you'll be muted during this presentation and I won't be able, I got rid of the bar at the top of the um, page for you. Sometimes it, it bothers people, but the disadvantage to that is that I don't see when there's any questions. So I will pull that bar up at the end. I'll be able to see if there's any questions and I'd be happy to answer them at that time. Um, please note that you will be muted during the presentation, and I ask that you make sure that you stay muted. After the webinar, a short survey will pop up on your screen. We would appreciate any feedback that you may have about today's presentation. So we'll go ahead and start, and um, don't fall short on safety. So this is what we're going to be looking at today. There's a lot to discuss uh, our high risk groups, what's, what is a fall, the importance of staying active, and the importance of using the correct assistive devices. The definition of a fall, why do we have to define a fall? Well, if someone lives within a community, a nursing home, a rehab, a memory support, a fall has a, a specific definition by um, the Department of uh, Medicare and Medicaid. And that is that a person, a fall is an event which results in a person coming to rest inadvertently on the ground, the floor, or a lower level. So say for instance, your resident is, you know, you have someone sitting in a chair, a wheelchair in any of those settings I talked about, not your home, but any of those community settings. And they slide down out of a lower um, they slide down lower than the seat of the chair. This is considered a fall. Why is this important? Because all four falls within a community setting have to be reported according to the Department for um, Medicare and Medicaid. So let's talk a little bit about our fall statistics. Many falls uh, don't cause injury, but the one out of five falls that does cause serious injury, such as a broken bone or a head injury. And these injuries can make it hard for a person to get around, do everyday activities, or live on their own. Each year, 3 million older adults are treated in emergency departments for fall injuries. Each year, at least 300,000 older adults are hospitalized for hip fractures. Falls are the most common cause of traumatic brain injury in older adults. Falls can call bro cause broken bones. Very common are wrist breaks, arms, ankles, and hip fractures. Falls can cause head injuries, which can be very serious, especially if a person is taking certain medications such as blood thinners. An older adult who falls and hit their head should be evaluated for a bleed or other internal injury. Falls with or without injuries also carry a heavy quality of life impact. A growing number of older adults fear falling and as a result will limit their activities and their social engagements. This can result in further physical decline, depression, social isolation, 
and feelings of helplessness. I wanna put in a 30 second commercial here and tell you that um, if any older adult should fall and hit their head, even if they do not lose consciousness, even if they say they are fine, even if they said they didn't hit their head that hard, they need to be evaluated. Why? Because as older adults, it is very normal for our brain to shrink. And it is also very normal to have some changes in our bone density and your skull is a bone. If you fall and, and the normal shrinking of the brain has occurred, it leaves more space for bleeding to occur without us knowing that there's a bleeding going on in the brain, okay? So say, for example, if I fall, well, I'm an older adult, so I won't use myself as an example. If my um, grandson fell and hit his head, he's probably going to, within 30 minutes, start, start to have some significant changes in his cognition. He may throw up. He may feel lethargic. We're going to know that there's a head injury going on and that there's a bleed. But in an older adult, because the brain shrinks a little, the space between the skull and the brain tissue becomes larger. You can have ongoing bleeding in the brain without us knowing it for a significant length of time, a day or two. By that time, there's significant damage done and that can lead to a person's um, mortality. So even though you feel good and you fall and hit your head, you need to be evaluated. Um, go to your nearest emergency room. It's really important to think about that. Every 19 minutes, an older adult dies from a fall. And every 11 seconds, they're treated in the emergency room. Falls are the leading cause of fatal injury and most common cause of non-fatal trauma related to hospital admissions among older adults. Falls result in more than 2.8 million injuries treated in the emergency department annually, including over 800,000 hospitalizations and more than 27,000 deaths. So the next three are just gonna be graphs. They're a little bit older, um, but you can see there really hasn't changed much. We know that, um, that the increase as the baby boomers get older and we become older adults, this number is gonna go up because the volume of older adults is significant. Seven falls death every hour by 2030 is what they're predicting. And it, this just kind of shows you the falls from uh, age group and uh, white males, white females, black males, black females. And again, this is probably an older graph and we really need to look at um, more of the cultural groups uh, should be inclusive <clears throat> in a graph like this, but I wasn't able to find any. So we're just looking at white and black here and you can see there's um, significant differences. And then this is according to their age, men and women. Women have more falls than men, but women live longer than men. So um, women have also the two things that are occurring with women is they live longer, but they also have history of osteoporosis is more significant in women than in men. So it's, it's all related to hormones. So let's talk about falls and fractures. The strongest determinant of fracture is the actual fall rather than the fall uh, fragility. More than 95% of hip fractures are caused by falling, and that's usually falling sideways. And again, um, women experience uh, more falls, but they experience three quarters of all hip fractures because women fall more than men. And again, women have more osteoporosis. Um, and we know that's going to weaken the bones and make them more likely to break. The chances of breaking your hip goes up as you get older. In a study that was back in 2017, they followed 122,000 people in the U.S. and Europe and found that um, all-cause mortality rate was doubled over the course of 12 years in those who had hip fractures. 
So the increase in mortality was greatest in the first year after the fracture. Keep that in mind. The increase in mortality was greatest in the first year after the fracture, almost three times as high as expected for the general geriatric population. This next number I'm going to tell you stuck in my brain when I learned it. I've never forgotten it. And I always tell people this because it really brings it home. And my dad fell and broke his hip and he was one of these people. Normal and healthy when he fall, fell, but 70% of the people over 70 that fall and fracture their hip will die within 18 months. Let me repeat that. 70% of the people over 70 that fall and fracture their hip will die within 18 months. Now, I don't mean to sound morbid and grim. I'm giving you these statistics because these are the statistics they are going to keep you upright and moving. Our job as older adults is to stand up on our two feet and move forward and not fall. And there's things that we can do about it and we'll talk about that in a minute. Combined with the trauma of fracture and surgery, an existing health condition significantly increases the risk of, of death. So if, if someone has Parkinson's or they have COPD or they have any, any comorbidities, when they fall and fracture their hip, that increases their risk for death. Um, I mentioned my dad, he was normal and healthy. He was 78 years old. He fell down the stairs um, on an untied shoelace carrying something and uh, fell down four steps, fractured his hip. And that was in November of, um, well, it's been 20 years, but uh, November of that year. And he died in July of that same year. So there's one of those statistics. Um, so one study showed that heart disease, stroke, and pneumonia result in long-term doubling of risk of death after hip fracture. And this risk remained high for up to 10 years in women and 20 years in men. So, you know, you're more likely after a hip fracture to um, have pneumonia, stroke, or heart disease. So it's, it's really, you know, break, falling and breaking your hip can be very catastrophic. All right, again, don't mean to sound like doom and gloom, but this is reality and we can change that. Uh, most falls uh, do not cause sufficient injury to uh, receive medical attention. That's the good news. I have a friend that um, got off her bike she was riding her bike, very physically active, and she had an electric bike and was just learning how to use it. And her driveway was on an incline and the bike went backwards on its own. And she tried to stop it and fell over the bike and broke her wrist. Not a serious injury. Nonetheless, it's an injury. But fractures that you see most common in older adults um, can be uh, just plain old hematomas. These are ha uh, just plain injuries. Hematoma, just some head trauma, dislocation of a joint or soft tissue, tissue injury. This is interesting. Impact of falls on the older adult. Falling once, falling one time, double your chances of falling again. All you have to do is fall once, and it doubles your chances of falling again because it limits your independence. You uh, develop a fear that will cut down on your everyday activities that increases your risk for falls. So falls result in injuries such as hip fractures, broken bones and head injuries. But if you fall and you don't hurt yourself, you, you may develop a fear of falling, and that's called post-fall syndrome, and that's what this looks like. So you have a fall, then you have a fear of the uh, falling again, then you develop this avoidance behavior. I don't want to go down those steps because I fell down those steps. 
that leads to inactivity, which leads to physical deconditioning, which creates muscle weakness, which develops into gait st instability. So your walking is not uh, firm and that increases a, your risk for falls. So this is what we call post fall syndrome. It's a real thing. And again, it starts with this fear of fall. And that's just unfortunately in, innate in many of us. And uh, when we self-reduce the activities and we're de decreasing our mobility, we're um, increasing our dependence and self-imposed limitations. So we really need to um, you know, work on this fear after a fall and get out and move. We know that falls also impact caregivers. So if you're taking care of someone and they have a fall, there's been reports from caregivers that after a caregiver's uh, recipient's first fall, caregivers report a significant increase in caregiver burden, fear of falling again or falling themselves and depression. So then you start to see a change in routine. And that uh, routine is they may start limiting the ambulation of their uh, person they're caring for. So they may start that caregiver, uh, that fall syndrome, that post-fall syndrome. Oh, let's talk about the cost of falls because they are pretty expensive. In over 800,000 people, uh, patients a year that are hospitalized because of fall injury, most often because of he head uh, or hip fracture, the total cost of fall injuries is um, in, in nine, uh, I'm sorry, 1917, whoa, in 2017 was 50 billion. Medicare and Medicaid shouldered about 75% of those costs. That's why if someone goes into a community and they see someone sliding out of their wheelchair, they, caught, they, they consider that a fall because it has to be reported, then they can go back and say, why is this person sliding out of their wheelchair? What are we doing to prevent that? Because that can lead to a actual injury. Um, so they work really hard to keep those costs down um, by people who are, are living in community cen uh, centers. The financial toll, uh, toll for older adults is expected to increase as the population ages and may reach $67.8 billion by 2024, by the end of 2024. An average hospital stay just for a couple of days is about $30,000. If you, you know, because if you fracture a hip, you're gonna go to surgery, You'll be in the hospital for a day or two, and then they discharge you right to rehab. So I'm talking about a hospital bill, which for three days may be about $30,000 or more. Let's talk about the need for medical attention. Um, falls among uh, adults 65 and older are very costly. We just talked about it. 29 million is paid by Medicare annually. 12 billion is paid by private or out of pocket um, pay, uh, payer's pocket. And 9 billion was paid by Medicaid. As a uh, number of Americans age 65 and older grows, we can expect the number of fall injuries and the cost to treat these injuries, of course, to, to uh, soar. The strongest determinant of a fracture is the actual fall rather than the bone uh, fragility. So, you know, if someone falls sideways, they're going to maybe injure their shoulder, fracture their shoulder or their hip. If they fall forward, it's probably going to be their wrists or their elbow, or it can be a compression fracture, their hands hitting the ground, and then the fracture radiates up the arm. 70% of the people over 70, we talked about those statistics. So we know that we know that direct medical costs include fees for hospitals and nursing home care, doctors, and other professional services such as rehab, community-based services, use of medical equipment, prescription medications, and insurance processing. 
So direct costs do not account for the long-term effects of those injuries, such as disability, dependence, uh, future dependence on others, lost time from work or household duties, and a reduction in quality of life and having to have a caregiver. So there is a psychological impact as well. There's an increased fear of falling that I talked about that limits your activities and social engagements. It increases your risk for depression, social isolation, and hopelessness. And if you've ever joined me on my program for um, isolation and loneliness, there are changes in the brain when someone is socially isolated and those changes can lead to depression. So now that I've been the Grim Reaper and I've come in and told you that, um, you know, falls are dangerous and they're gonna cause you a lot of harm and it's gonna cost a lot of money, Let's talk about some of the common risks for falls. Um, one thing that we know is typically they're multifactorial, so a multi multidisciplinary approach is necessary to prevent the management of falls. So it's usually not one thing, it's, it's a combination of different things. Um, there's three things that we look at at falls. That's ex, uh, extrinsic, intrinsic, and situate situational factors. So we know that aging is one that affects falls. We know that we become less active. There may be some mobility issues. We're taking more medications. A lot of those medications have interactions and some of those may cause changes in your cognition or um, maybe you feel lightheaded or dizzy. Uh, well, there's changes in eyesight and hearing and poor nutrition. So those are, when we talk about the common risk factors, intrinsic is the changes in body that increase risk of falls. The extrinsic is the hazards in the home or our community. And then situational are things that seniors do and don't do that increase the risk of falls. And here's where we can start looking at things that we can do to help decrease the uh, risk factors. So let's talk a little bit about intrinsic more, a little bit more. Females, I think I've said this, fall more than males. We know that people that have chronic illnesses or and also comorbidities, um, such as Parkinson's disease, if you have arthritis of the hip and or knees and foot issues, you're higher risk for fall. If you have more than one chronic disease, so if I have high blood pressure and I'm diabetic, that means I have two chronic diseases. And most people usually have more than one chronic disease at our age. Neuromuscular and vestibular diseases, such as Meniere's disease, problems with the inner ears that make you dizzy. Medications, medication interactions, Medic, there's some medications that shouldn't be taken with other medications because the, the, the interactions of both of those can change your blood pressure and can drop it very low or get it very high. And we know either one of those, if it's high, it can cause confusion and headaches. Low, it can cause confusion and dizziness. So medications, uh, we'll talk about you know how frequent um, remediation of your medications is important. A uh, visual impairment, if you have macular degeneration, you're losing your peripheral vision um, and you can't see the dangers that are out off to the side. Um, glaucoma will change your vision. Cataracts will diminish your vision. So again, making sure that you are seeing an ophthalmologist, not just an optometrist, you need to see an ophthalmologist and besides Medicare will pay for an ophthalmologist. Um, but they're the ones that can work with you with glaucoma and um, uh, macular degeneration and things that need more medical attention. Hearing impairment, uh, again, if you're not aware of the dangers that are uh, around you, um, you can't hear uh, sirens go off or things like that, that's going to cause some issues. It may be startling to you and cause, trigger you to fall. Cognitive impairment, 
Uh, people with cognitive impairment lose some of their judgment, so they may um, begin risky behaviors, such as crossing a street without looking both ways, um, you know, not looking at the curb when they're stepping down, um, you know, so there's cognitive issues that will cause a change in your judgment. And then drugs and alcohol addiction. And we know that both of those will cause a change in cognition, poor judgment, and um, change in behavior as well. So uh, those are some of the intrinsic factors that, that occur. And we'll talk about, I've talked about some of the things that you can do, like getting your an, annual Medicare checkup, uh, going to the eye doctor annually, uh, and again, going to an ophthalmologist, getting your hearing checked uh, once a year at least. And if people say that you're not hearing well, um, don't blow it off because they probably um, know that you're not hearing well by either not paying attention to a conversation or substituting uh, letters for words that you think you have heard. And um, so again, uh, getting your hearing checked. Uh, remediating your medications, sitting down with your doctor, maybe um, at least quarterly or, you know, quarterly if you could, but um, otherwise twice a year sitting down with your doctor and saying, these are the medications I've been on. Do I still need to be on these? When you get a new medication, listen to what the pharmacist says. They know all about medications. Trust your pharmacist. Um, our pharmacist, Tether, is wonderful. Uh, I just started a new medication two weeks ago, and she told me some of the side effects and uh, what to watch out for and if there were any drug interactions with other medications. So those things are very helpful. So let's talk about some of the extrinsic factors, and that's really the surrounding your house. Um, it's environmental. Um, inadequate lighting. My son is a firefighter and he said one of the things that he sees when he goes into about 90% of older adults homes for someone who has fallen um, <clears throat> and they need help is that there is inadequate lighting. There are ceiling fixtures that have bulbs that are out. They have lamps that are bulbs that are out. Some firehouses like him <clears throat> always carry extra light bulbs, but if you're an older adult and you can't reach those light bulbs when family comes over, have a, you know, have a supply of those light bulbs and say to your family member, can you help me put those, those lights up? Those are the light, good lighting is extremely important. Lack of grab bars in bathrooms, um, you know, getting in and out of a bathtub. If you don't have a shower and you have to go over the lip of a bathtub, that's when some falls occur, but also a lot of falls occur in the tub when the bottom of the tub gets very slippery. So along with grab bars in your bathroom, make sure you have a non-slip um, uh, pad in your bathtub, but also make sure you have a non-slip uh, rug on the outside of your bathtub that you can step onto so you're not stepping onto a slippery floor. Slippery floors are dangerous as well as stairs. Um, you know, maybe other people have this problem. Our we have an older refrigerator, and so every now and then we get a couple ice cubes that fall out of the ice maker. I can hear it, but they fall to the ground. I go almost immediately, or my husband does, and we pick up those ice cubes. If we let them melt on the floor, first of all, it might ruin the floor, but also when we go to the kitchen and we go to the refrigerator to get something or put something away, we're going to fall. We're going to slip and fall on that water. So you want to make sure that your floors are not slippery. If you are putting a new floor into a bathroom in your home, put something that has a little gradation or a little texture to it only because it, it grips a little bit better than something that's pure marble. People who have lost weight and are wearing clothes that are too big for them, their pants are going to fall. They're going, they can trip and fall on their pants. Shoes that don't fit, 
shoes that are too big just because someone gave you a pair of shoes and they look brand new. If they're not the right size, don't use them. Cracked or uneven sidewalks, um, you know, make your, uh, your community responsible for those sidewalks. Uh, repair, tell them when they're, they're um, you know, causing a hazard. And then looser rugs, you really want to pull up all um, uh, rugs, throw rugs in your house that are not necessary. They may look pretty, they may prevent a little bit of dirt from coming in, but you want a carpet. If you want a mat at the front door, make sure it's texturized, make sure the water can't pool on it, make sure that it grips to the, um, the floor. <laughs> if it doesn't have a grip on the floor, you're gonna slip and fall on it and pull up any um, rugs that are not necessary. Situational vectors, walking while talking and walking while talking on the phone, knock on wood. This is the one and only fall that I had and it taught me a lesson. I was walking in a parking lot into a store and um, because I wasn't paying 100% attention because I was talking to someone on the phone I saw the curb, but I, I missed the, um, you know, the divot that allows you to walk up without stepping on the curve, curb, and I tripped and fell over the curb, and I, um, you know, as I'm falling, I'm thinking, watch my head, watch my head, and both hands went out. I was able to stop my fall. I um, landed on both hands and my knees, and I don't have good knees. Luckily, the only thing that happened was my hands got a little rug burn from the cement, um, but I've never walked and talked on my phone again. If I'm going to ta talk, I stop and I talk. Um, you cannot, absolutely, as an older adult, it is more difficult to multitask. I was an excellent multitasker when I was younger. I find that I have to pick and choose what I'm doing as an older adult, and that's okay. So make sure that um, you're um, walking and you're looking at, you know, you don't want to look completely down all the time. You want to look ahead, but you need to look at the surfaces. My husband was walking once. He was younger at this time, but again, he's never done it. He had both hands in his pocket and he was walking with someone else. And he came home and his whole face was bloody. He had fallen flat on his face. So never walk with your hands in your pockets either. Take your time. I know for older adults, this is a problem rushing to the bathroom. Um, it's better that you have a little accident when you're getting to the bathroom, then you trip and fall and you end up going anyways because you're on the ground. Take your time. Listen to your body, know when it's giving you the message that you have to go to the bathroom. If you're not getting enough sleep at night, if you're restless at night, if you're, if you're up, if you're only getting a couple hours of sleep, that definitely is going to have a change in your cognition. And then we go back to those intrinsic, back, uh, intrinsic factors where you're not getting enough sleep and rest. So make sure that you're getting at least a good seven to eight hours of sleep every night. If you're not sleeping well at night, you need to talk to your doctor about that. There are things that you can do that are non-medical to help that. What I urge you never to do is take an over-the-counter sleep aid Never take uh, something like uh, Benadryl or Tylenol PM. They have uh, medicines in there that can alter your cognition. And um, that can be very dangerous. If you have to get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, that's going to increase your fall. So you need to stay away from those. Medications. Most people use three or more medications as older adults. But again, it depends on what type of medications, what their drug interactions, what their side effects are, are very important. So you should be able to sit down with someone and talk to them. We do have a person um, that we refer to if you would like to. She's a pharmacist who now owns her own business. And she goes into people's homes and reviews their drugs for them. 
and tells them and finds out why, you know, what are they using them? Um, uh, is this a medication you don't use anymore? You need to get rid of the medications you're not using because if you still have it in the cabinet, you may accidentally take it. Um, if you're taking a lot of things that aren't necessary, a lot of older adults are experiencing what we call polypharmaceutical, which means they're getting medications from one doctor, then they're going to another doctor, and um, you know that uh, gets medicine from there, and then neither doctor knows the other one is giving them these medications. So having someone evaluate that for you is uh, very good if you're interested in that. I can forward that name on to you. Um, and again, um, she's done a couple of talks for us and she um, is a, a pharmacist that will go into the home. Um, drug dispensers, extremely important, extremely important. Having a system that's not inside a medication dispenser, you might be over or underdosing yourself. If you don't, I can look at my case and I can look at this and go, um, you know, after I'm done here, can I go, did I take my medicines this morning? Because sometimes we forget. And though it becomes, it becomes so much of our routine that we don't even think about it. But I can go to back to my medicine case and go, oh, no, I didn't. They're still in the case for uh, Tuesday. Or, you know what, I, they're gone. So I took them this morning. And then that helps trigger my memory. So Whatever you're, um, you're doing, I highly recommend a medication dispenser case. You can buy those anywhere. Um, you'll figure out something that works for you. But you can also, your pharmacies can also put your medicines in what they call a bubble pack where your medication is actually dispensed. They, they um, you know, kind of set your meds up at the pharmacy, put them in bubble packs and send them to you. It's a little more expensive. But if you're someone that has a lot of medications and you take a lot of medications in one day, that might be help you, helpful to keep them straight. So let's talk a little bit about um, home safety. We talked a little bit about the bathroom, making sure that there's grab bars, make sure there's proper lighting. Um, and we talked about a, a non-slip bathroom mat. Um, you wanna make sure that uh, you have a reach bar near your, your toilet if you're having a difficult time pulling yourself up. So a reach bar or grab bar is helpful. You want to make sure that um, you move all those throw rugs. So once, once this is what we do and everybody does a difference. Once we are done showering in the morning, I take my shower mat and I throw it over my um, shower curtain. First to let it dry, but second, it takes it out of, uh, it's not a slip hazard for me. So um, that's just an idea. Everybody does it a little different. Make sure all electrical cords are uh, secured against the wall and away from, um, you know, any water. And you should have um, uh, outlets that are water secured. Um Think about giving the gift of fall prevention to someone that you know. Is your, um, do you need a fall alarm system? There's a lot of different systems out there. Um, I have an Apple Watch and um, if I were to fall, it a lot, I, I've got it set up where it uh, asks me, do I, did I fall? Yes or no? Because sometimes if I clap or wave my hand, it's it's gonna ask me those questions. Then I just hit no. But if I said yes, it'll say, "Do you need nine one one, or can we call someone?" And I click yes, and it'll either either alert the emergency uh, response team for me, or call uh, that person that's next on my list to assist me. So that uh, again, there's different fall alarm systems. Raised toilets, very important, especially if you're gonna have hip or knee surgery, um, or if you're having difficulty getting up and down, uh, either a raised toilet seat, or you may have a plumber put in a higher toilet seat for you. They're a godsend. Making sure uh, maybe for someone uh, that needs new glasses and they can't afford them, maybe getting them their new glasses. If you're a member of Costco, and I'm sure you all know this, if you are, 
um, glasses are significantly cheaper at Costco than any place else you'll go. Installing rain, we talked about grab bars in, in the showers, those are very important, but install railings on both sides of your stairs um, because as you're going up and down stairs as older adults, you may need to hang on to both railings. Automatic lights or timers for stairways inside and outside entrances are good ideas to have um, sensor lights go on. Small flashlights that attach to keys, also flashlights that small flashlights that you can put at your bedside. Um, this is kind of funny, but uh, during the spring, we had an issue with moths um, and we couldn't figure out where they were coming from. We had someone come and they said, we don't know where they're coming from either, which was very helpful. Um, at least he didn't charge us for the visit, but uh, my husband went and bought one of those. It's a blue light and it attaches to the outlet like a, like a night light and it's got a sticky side to it. And on the sticky side is the attracts the, the blue light attracts the moths and then the moths get stuck on the opposite side. So we don't have the problem anymore, but I told my husband, leave it there. It's a great night light. It is not something that um, I find obtrusive, but at night when I get up to go to the bathroom, it gives a very nice glow that is lower in the room and I can see that path to the bathroom. Exercise, always consult a healthcare provider, you know, before engaging in activity. I think the important thing is really strength and resistance training. Balance exercises are extremely important. If you just stand at your counter or your kitchen table uh, or your island in your kitchen and you put both hands um, on the, the counter and then stand on one foot and then try it with one hand and then do it on the opposite foot. Both hands on the counter and then bring that foot up and let go with the hand on the, the leg that you are um, bringing off the, the ground. And um, you can find balance exercises for older adults, strength or resistance training for older adults on YouTube. Chair exercises, chair yoga is wonderful. And we have exercise programs. Many of you out there might be involved in this but we have exercise programs, uh, step out to fitness and um, you know, it's done on Zoom. So you don't even have, you can do it in the comfort of your own home. Some of the evidence-based fall preventions, um, you can go to uh, just type in matter of balance, staying active and independent life or stepping on are three programs that you can pull up on your computer and you will find will be very beneficial to strengthen your upper extremities and your lower extremities. You want your upper extremities to um, also be strong because if you do fall and you don't hurt yourself, how are you going to get up unless you have an upper strength with you? So you want to make sure that you're lifting some light weights on top too, two cans of beans to start with. And then go to, you know, one pound weights and, you know, you don't want to start with three pounds and four pounds and you may never get that high, but doing those exercises and strengthening that open arm, uh, it, the upper arms are very important. Medications we talked about already, um, uh, reconcile them regularly. Uh, Use large print labels. Ask you know the pharmacies can do that. So ask them to do that. Uh, again, talk to your pharmacist. They are a wealth of information. They know more about medications than doctors do, because that's what they went to school primarily for. They also have a database at their um, at you know at their hand that the doctors don't have. So um, ask them those questions. Uh, you know, ask your pharmacist when you go, what is the um, best time to come when it's not busy? And it's not going to be late in the day and it's not going to be first thing in the morning, but ask them when the best time to come and pick up your meds are, especially if you're starting a new medication and you want to ask them some questions, they'll have time to talk with you. And you don't want to talk to the med tech 
They're wonderful in their own right, but the pharmacist is the person that has all the answers. Some of the side effects that medications cause that can increase the risk are falls. Um, they will cause uh, vertical dizziness and lightheadedness. We may see a drop in blood pressure when getting up from a, a sitting position or a laying position. You may have difficulty with balance or your reactions might be slow or a little off balance. Maybe loss of, of concentration, decreased alertness and lethargy, which is fatigue and tiredness and blurred vision. Those all increases risks for falls. Nutrition. Uh, you want to make sure that you're taking in food that give you the strength and mobility. So you want to make sure you're taking in enough protein. There's different ways to get protein. If you're not getting enough from your um, fruits and, and your meats and your vegetables, um, you want to make sure there's not a lot of protein in, in, in fruits, but there's protein in veg some vegetables, but there's also protein in your meats. Um, but you want to, and fish, but if you're not doing that, make sure that you're drinking a supplement. You want to avoid dehydration. Dehydration is a, another reason for falls. Most of the people that go to the emergency room who are sick, who are <clears throat> confused, who are dizzy, um, who don't feel well, it's usually because they are dehydrated. Make sure that you're drinking enough uh, fluids every day. Water is the best fluid to drink. Uh, make sure that you're taking in foods that have a lot of uh, water in them, cucumbers, watermelons, vegetables. Those all have added fluid to it. You also want to watch for signs of weight loss or weight gain. And if you uh, did fall, you want to make sure that you're taking in nutrients, especially protein, when recovering from a fall. We've talked about seeing your, uh, your care provider regularly, making sure that you're wearing glasses that are the most current prescription. If your glasses are broken, broken. If your glasses are broken, sorry. Um, make sure that they get fist appropriately. Sometimes I see people with their glasses and they're taped in the, um, the nose area, the bridge of the nose or the side. And because it's taped, it's now lopsided. That's not gonna help your vision at all. So make sure that your eye repair is appropriate. If your doctor says it's time to remove cataracts, take their advice. Have your hearing tested regularly. Um, you can go to an audiologist to do this. You can go to an ENT, an ear, nose and throat. Uh, doctor to do this. But again, if you um, are a member of Costco, you can get your hearing checked at Costco. That's where I got my hearing uh, aids and got my hearing check at. Uh, I go annually to get my hearing done at Costco. They are, and I don't know, I'm not a Sam's Club member. So if anyone is a Sam's Club member and you know that they have the same things, vision and hearing at Sam's Club, go ahead and put it in the chat and we can share that at the end. But um, the people that I see at uh, Costco are um, audiologists. They've gone to the, and speech pathologists, they've gone to the same schools that you would see in an ENT's office. And I have to tell you that I was seeing uh, an audiologist in private practice when I got my first set of hearing aids and um, I paid less and got a better test than I did at the audiologist at the office. That's just my personal experience. Everyone has um, different experiences, but there are places that you can get it just a little bit cheaper. If you don't have an assistive device and you need one, you should get one. If you have an assistive device and it has not been fitted for you, then you need to make sure you're getting fitted by a physical therapist or an occupational therapist. So, um, you know, you want to make sure that your cane, if you're using a cane, your hand is um, slightly, your elbows slightly bent. Same with your walkers, your elbows should be slightly bent. Uh, your wheelchair or your scooter should be in good working order. Uh, <clears throat> my aunt had a walker that, um, I needed to bring her to the doctor with, and this was the walker that she was using. 
And I noticed that the treads on the wheels were gone. And I told her that and she kind of grumbled and said, it's fine. And then the doctor looked at her wheelchair or her um, walker and said, you can't use that walker anymore. It's dangerous if you don't have the right tread. So, you know, if, if you've had a walk, a wheel walker a long time and the wheels are threadbare, you wouldn't drive a car with the wheels threadbare. You don't want to use a wheelchair or a walker with threadbare wheels either. You can ask for a risk evaluation at, uh, this is a website where I got a lot of my information from, but it's on the CDC and it's called STEADI, S-T-E-A-D-I, and it's an acronym for something. Um, oh, here it is, Stopping Elderly Accidents, Deaths, and Injuries, okay? And you pull that up, S-T-E-A-D-I, it's all capitals, and I just pulled it up before we came on. It's still working. There's tons of information on there for you about uh, doing a risk evaluation. So they're gonna ask you when you go to the doctor annually for your Medicare exam, did you fall in the last six months? And if you said no, and you're telling the truth, um, they probably won't ask you much more than that. They may ask you if you've ever been dizzy or anything, but if they don't, this is what the key elements of a fall-focused physical exam is. <laughs> Excuse me. They're going to look at your blood pressure going down, which is what we call orthostatic hypotension. And that's your blood pressure dropping when you go from a laying to a sitting and a sitting to a standing position. That can cause dizziness and cause you to pass out or fall. They'll uh, look at your visual acuity. They may listen to your heart. They may have you to walk uh, and look at how you're walking, which is your gait, and then have you stand on one foot, balance. They'll look at your lower extremities, look at uh, your back and make sure that there's nothing going on with your back or your knees. You may have, maybe you need a knee replacement. Then they'll do a neurological exam, a cognitive screen. They'll look to make sure that you have the right sensation in your lower and upper extremities. Uh, proprioception is kind of where you are in the environment. Uh, they may have you stand in a certain location in the room and say, tell me where you are in relationship to this room. I'm to the right of the door. I'm to the left of the door, something like that. Then they'll look at your reflexes and your range of motion. Those are all very, very important when we look at a fall focused physical exam. These are different fall risk assessments. Um, I'm just gonna go through a couple of them. And these are the three that um, you'll see the most that they may have you do. The Let me go back here. These are more for practitioners, but I wanted you to see what they look like, what they may have you do and why they're doing it. The Timed Up and Go, or TUG, tests functional mobility. To perform the test, you need a chair and a stopwatch, or a wristwatch with a second hand. Have your patient start by sitting on the chair, feet flat on the floor, one foot slightly in front of the other, and hands on the armrests of the chair. Put a line on the floor 10 feet or 3 meters away. Ask your patient to stand up from the chair and walk at her normal pace to the line on the floor when you say go. When she reaches the line, she should turn around, walk back to the chair, and sit down. Be sure to start timing on the signal go, and even if your patient has not started to move, and stop timing at the moment she sits back down in the chair. While she's walking, stand between the chair and the line in case the patient loses her balance and you need to assist. Observe and note the patient's posture, width of the base of support, step height, stride length, arm swing, and path. When the test is complete, record the time. Also record whether the patient used an assistive device. And so it looks pretty easy um, when you can do it, but there are people that can't do that. So, and that's what the purpose of it. This is a balance test that they would do. The four-stage balance test assesses static balance, which is an important part of postural stability. To perform the test, you only need a stopwatch. Tell your patient that you will show her four positions, 
and would like her to try and stand in each position for 10 seconds. She can hold her arms out or move her body to keep her balance, but should not move her feet. For each position, describe and demonstrate it, and then stand next to her and hold her arm if needed to help her assume the correct foot position. When your patient is steady, you can let go. Say ready, begin, and begin timing. But you should stand close enough so that you can catch her if she loses her balance. After 10 seconds, say stop and record the time she was able to hold the position. If a patient can hold a position for 10 seconds without moving their feet or needing support, go on to the next position. If not, stop the test at this point. For the first position, the patient should stand with her feet side by side. For the second position, she should place one foot so it is touching the instep of the other foot. For the third position, she should place the heel of one foot in front of the other foot, touching the big toe. For the fourth and last position, have the patient stand on one foot. An older adult who cannot hold the tandem stance or either of the two prior stances for at least 10 seconds each is at increased risk of falling. Okay, and then the last one is this 30 second chair stand. The 30 second chair stand tests functional lower body strength. To administer this test, you'll need a chair with a straight back and a stopwatch. Place the rear legs of the chair against a wall so that it cannot slide backwards. Have your patient sit towards the front of the chair and fold her arms across her chest. Ask her to keep her feet flat on the floor and sit upright. She should try to stand up, keeping her arms folded across her chest without pushing off with her arms. When you say go, she should stand up all the way and then sit back down, doing this as quickly as she can until you say stop. Arms should remain folded across her chest throughout the test. Stand close enough so that you can catch the patient if she loses her balance. If the patient gets tired, she may rest, but let the time keep going. If she cannot stand even once, the test score is zero. Not being able to stand up from a chair without using one's arms to push up indicates a high risk for falls. Record the number of times. So that's the patient's different ways that they check that. This last thing I want you to see is pretty interesting with AI uh, coming into play. We're going to see more and more predictors, but this is a sensor that actually predicts when people are going to fall. Wix gives you the power of AI to build the website you need. everyone that's pretty much it we'll go back to our questions and answers if you have any i see two things you know what i don't know what that and i'm really sorry jeffrey there is i don't know what that thing is because i don't see